goodness. I love you, Good Shepherd. I'm so proud to call myself your pastor uh, for the ways that you, um, you shepherd, your re- you shepherd uh, for the ways that you steward your resources for the good of the kingdom and for the ways that you are the hands and the feet of Jesus. Uh, I see God's kingdom in you and in this church as it is in heaven. And we get to do this. We get to do this. What a thrill. And so I'm so excited to be with you today and open up the word. And so as we continue to prepare our hearts for God's word for us this morning, let us pray. God, we thank you so much for the goodness and the power of your kingdom your kingdom that brings about healing, your kingdom that brings about belonging, your kingdom that brings about goodness. And God, we thank you that we not only get to enjoy it, but we get to participate in it. And so Lord, we pray that in these next few moments, as you speak to us, that we would be nourished to be better stewards of your kingdom that we would be nourished to be empowered and propelled for your mission in this world. God, we pray that your spirit would have your way and that we would have ears to hear, a heart to receive, a mind to understand, and eyes to see. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Many of you um, who've been around here long enough know that I have a little bit of an embarrassing legacy here. An embarrassing legacy that began some 13 years ago in the sanctuary. You see, I was invited by Pastor Craig, Greg and Gary to preach the Ash Wednesday service. And I was a young and up and coming pastor. They were mentoring me. And so this was a big deal. I was so excited to preach Ash Wednesday because Ash Wednesday here at Good Shepherd is kind of a big deal. It's, it's Big attendance, a lot of people coming out, and so I was shaking. I was so nervous. I spent so much time preparing. Pastor Greg and Gary and Glenn, they coached me, they mentored me. And so by the time the big day came, I thought I was ready. And the instructions were uh, that we were supposed to go and do the imposition of the ashes. And immediately after the imposition of the ashes, I was supposed to go up to the platform and then give about a 10-minute homily. And so I visualized this so many different times through, and when the moment came for us to do the imposition of the ashes, I stood up, and my mic pack that I thought was firmly connected to my waist slipped through my skirt. But this didn't happen until like I was already walking, and I didn't want to draw attention to it, I didn't want to create a scene, and so I decided that I was just going to keep on walking with the mic pack dragging on the ground, hoping that no one would notice. And so when I went to go do the imposition of the ashes, uh, all I could think about was, how am I going to fix my mic pack before I have to get up there and preach? And so I'm doing the ashes, and apparently that's all I could think about, because it turns out the ashes were huge and falling down people's faces as I was doing it. And so when it came to time then for, for me to go up uh, and preach, I had to fix my mic pack. So I had my Bible in one hand, and then I had this glass bowl of ash in another. And it's kind of awkward trying to fix a mic pack, especially the way that feminine clothing is. And so I went and I hid behind the organist. And the organist there, for some reason, thought that I was there to impose ashes on him. And he really didn't want any at the time. He just kept saying, no, thank you, no, thank you. And this was just flustering me even more. I was so stressed out because I was supposed to be up there preaching. So I've got this glass bowl of ash in one hand, and I'm trying to pull up my mic pack. And what some of you don't know is behind there, there are these air conditioning vents and heating vents that just blow like an F5 tornado. (laughs) And as I bent over to fix this mic pack with one hand, this glass bowl of ash tips over and hits this metal vent and goes up like a black plume of ash and into my face. My husband said that he was standing in the very back uh, near the overflow in the sanctuary and he said that he heard the crash, he saw the black plume and he said, I just didn't know what to do so I started to pray for you, honey. And I took my hands and I just felt my face and I could just feel ash all over it. And I thought, how am I going to pull it together to preach? And so I just quickly wiped off my face and I turn around and I see Pastor Greg, Gary, and Glenn sitting there in the front row laughing at me. (laughs) I can't tell you how many Ash Wednesdays went by that I received a text from one of them uh, saying, don't spill ash on your face this year. Uh, 
that's kind of gone down in Good Shepherd history and legacy. Uh, and thankfully, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a wonder that you called me back to be your pastor. Um, it's kind of a wonder. Uh, but, but you know what, thankfully, we've gotten past that and you're entrusting me to be your pastor. And could you imagine if, if I, I had gone down in history and when you called me back to be your pastor, you, you would have said, oh no, that's Ash Wednesday Terabeth. We don't want her. If I would have gotten that kind of nickname. Um, well, in our text today, one individual has a nickname that he's not probably would not be proud of if he knew today that he had been given this nickname. He has a little bit of a legacy, which is kind of wild because this individual that has this somewhat of a negative legacy and has been given this nickname, um, it's, it's wild that for this one moment uh, that he's been given this name, Doubting Thomas, you heard of him? There's one moment in history where he questions the validity of the risen Lord and now he's been given this name, Doubting Thomas. And so we often look at this text and we say, oh, that's the Doubting Thomas text and we make it about the doubts of Thomas, which it does make a a great sermon for sure. However, when we make it about Doubting Thomas, we miss the point of the story. We miss the entire point of the story. And the point is Jesus. Let's take a look. This morning we're going to open up at John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when he came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it to my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Because blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord today, my friends. So this story begins in a place of anxiety and fear. We know this because the text tells us that the disciples are in a room with the doors locked. Why would the doors be locked? Because they're afraid. Jesus was just killed, and they weren't sure if because they were followers of Jesus, if they also would be killed. Would they also be crucified? Would they also maybe be in prison? They had no idea if their lives were on the line because of their association with Jesus. And so they are behind locked doors. And I would imagine that the conversations in that room were were fear, ridden, but also wonder. You see, Mary Magdalene had just given them the news that Jesus was alive, that she saw him with her eyes. And she goes back and she tells the disciples and the disciples run back to the tomb and they discover that in many ways, Mary was right, that he's not there in the tomb anymore, but they never saw him. So they didn't know what to believe. They didn't know what to think. But then in a moment, 
Jesus comes through these locked doors and his very first words are words of assurance and peace in the face of anxiety. And he says, peace be with you. Such words of assurance in the, in, uh, the face of anxiety. And so Jesus, as he says, peace be with you, he then breathes on them and he says, may the Holy Spirit be with you. And what we see is Jesus presents himself with his wounds. He presents himself not only as the risen Lord, but also as the crucified Lord. And as he breathes the Holy Spirit on them, he says, just as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Uh, This breathing of the Holy Spirit or giving of the Holy Spirit and inviting them to receive the Holy Spirit is a call and a commissioning of sorts a call and a commissioning to live out the mission that Jesus had given them. And then the disciples, they go on and they tell Thomas. Thomas wasn't there, he wasn't there in the room and they tell Thomas exactly what they had just seen. And they tell Thomas, they say, we have seen the Lord. He's not dead, he's alive, we've seen him. And Thomas coils back a little bit and he doubts. What's interesting, we've given him this name Doubting Thomas, but the disciples surely also doubted. When Mary Magdalene went and told them that that Jesus was alive, they weren't sure. They had to go see for themselves. They ran to the tomb and they still at this point weren't sure. They also were doubting. But Thomas says, unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I put my fingers where the nails are, and if I put my hand into the side, I will not believe it. I have to see him with my own eyes. I'm sure that Thomas longed to see Jesus. I'm sure he wanted it to be real. I'm sure that he wanted to experience it. And then in a moment again, Jesus appears. And as Jesus appears to him, he commands him, do not be unbelieving, but believing. He says, look, see, Look with your eyes, see Thomas, abandon your skepticism, abandon your doubt, abandon your place of unbelief and move to a place of belief and embracing the reality. And Jesus, as he's he's presenting himself, he doesn't attempt to shame Thomas. This isn't a word of shame. This isn't a word of, you foolish person, how could you not believe? But instead, what Jesus does is he presents himself there to Thomas. He gives himself to Thomas. And in this declaration, come, see, look with your own eyes, experience it, touch, see, it's me, Thomas, I am here. And then in this moment, Thomas can see, and he erupts, my Lord, my God. Now, oftentimes, we skip right through this proclamation of Thomas's response. And sometimes we reduce it to just a factual statement, as if he was just saying, "Uh, yep, check, I see you're here, you're standing in front of me. And what we miss is that this is a profoundly robust Christological statement. See, in theology, we have something called a high Christology and a low Christology. A high Christology, uh, which is what we believe we have here at Good Shepherd, we have a very high Christology here. A high Christology is a belief that Jesus was fully divine, uh, that Jesus was fully God, and also fully human. A low Christology would be uh, someone saying, yeah, I mean, he was kind of divine, but more human. Uh, more on the flesh side than on the divine side. Well, Thomas, here in this moment, he gets it. He understands as he says, my Lord, my God. Now, one of the things that I love about the Gospel of John is the entire text, the entire Gospel seems as though it is crescendoing to this moment, to this proclamation when Thomas says, my Lord, my God, he makes this profoundly high and robust Christological statement because this is where the entire Gospel begins. John chapter one, verse one, for example, tells us, it says, in the beginning was the word, 
And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. In him was life and that life was the light of mankind. So the gospel text begins out, begins with this profoundly robust Christological, high Christological vision. That in the beginning was the word. We know the word to be Jesus and the word was with God. It says that he was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made. In other words, we believe that the word being Jesus was there in the beginning was the one that summoned the waves to crash into the shore, was the one that summoned the mountains to lift up to the skies, was the one that summoned the sun to rise and the sun to set, that in him all things are held together. And the gospel kind of continues to crescendo to this moment and to this proclamation in verse 14. It says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In other words, God moved into the neighborhood, became flesh, and it says we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. We see this repeated theme in John's gospel. John continues to repeat over and over the divinity of Jesus. In other words, that Jesus wasn't just a teacher, that Jesus wasn't just a rabbi. Uh, In fact, in verse 18, John goes on, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God. Again, you hear that? Uh, This is something that is very unique to the gospel of John. Uh, And and then Jesus even makes statements like this. In John chapter 14, verse seven, Jesus says, if you really know me, uh, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so over and over in John's gospel, we see this high Christology that eventually climaxes to Thomas's declaration. He gets it. Everything that Jesus has been saying up until now, everything that Jesus has been proclaiming, if you wanna know what God is like, look at me. And he gets it. And the moment that he sees Jesus, he erupts. My Lord, my God. And what we discover is Thomas finally understands that God is revealed in Jesus. Yes, Jesus had been teaching this, but now he gets it. If we wanna know what God is like, God is revealed in Jesus. As Jesus standing before Thomas, see, look, touch, know, believe. And one of the things that I love about this is this is an offer of grace. This is an offer of mercy. This is an offer of forgiveness. This is an offer in which Jesus moves towards Thomas in his doubting. This is an offer in which Jesus moves towards Thomas in his wondering and his anxiousness. And what Jesus does is he offers hope, he offers grace, he offers forgiveness, he offers love. And again, Thomas's confession is not just factual, but notice that he also says, my Lord, my God, and acknowledging the divinity of Jesus, he is also acknowledging the relationship that he has, that this isn't just any God. This isn't just some distant, far off God who created the heavens and the earth who will someday disappear. But this is someone who he is choosing to order his life around. He is committing his entire life to the ways of Jesus. He is committing his entire life to the lordship of Jesus. He is reordering and reorienting his life. And what we see also is that this confession is so profoundly courageous. Anytime the disciples would have proclaimed Jesus as Lord and my Lord, they were putting their lives on the line. They were risking their lives. If any Roman official or any Roman soldier would have heard anyone call anyone but Caesar or Domitian, who was the ruler at the time, Lord, that was civil disobedience. They would have been imprisoned. They would have been persecuted. It was dangerous for them to have a high Christology. In other words, what that tells us is that in choosing to declare Jesus Christ as Lord, 
as my Lord, as my God, was a choice to alter their entire lives around this reality. It was a choice to reorder their entire lives around the re- this reality. And this is absolutely consistent to what we see throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts any time someone encountered the risen Lord. And any time anyone ever declared, my Lord, my God, and understand the Lordship of Jesus, understand the divinity of Jesus, and understood the incarnation of Jesus, when they came underneath that, they understood it in such a way that it reoriented their lives They did a 180 in their lives. They moved from unbelieving to believing. They moved, and oftentimes, from selfishness to generosity. They moved from pride to humility. They moved from, from keeping to themselves to hospitality and saying, what's mine is yours, what's yours is mine. It changed their entire lives and they were willing to put their lives on the line for this reality. Where in one moment they were moving in one direction with the way of the world and the next moment they were moving against the grain for the sake of Jesus and for the mission of God. They were willing to lay down their lives for this reality. Then Jesus says to them, he says, because you've seen me, you believed. And blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. You see, Jesus knew that he was about to ascend to the Father. And those who read this gospel, the text tells us, who sees the signs and wonders, may they also believe. May we also receive the life that Jesus offers, the grace. May we also see the Jesus who comes and gives himself to us over and over and over again. Because here's what I want you to know this morning. That, some, that same revelation of God made known in Christ is available to us today. See, there's this incredible Trinitarian theology that because of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, because our risen Lord has ascended to the throne, the King is among us today. And because of the fellowship of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in Christ is made known and is available to us today. And just as Jesus offered himself to Thomas, Jesus offers himself to us over and over. Jesus offers himself to the doubting. Jesus offers himself to the confused. Jesus offers himself to those who even coil back and aren't so sure. Jesus offers himself to the hard-hearted. Jesus offers himself to the prideful, to the hurting, and what he does every single time that he offers himself over and over and over again is he invites us to respond and to lean in, to look, to see, to know, to believe, and to do the same kind of 180 from unbelieving to believing, to doubting, to embracing, and to confess, my Lord, my God. And my friends, when we do, our entire lives are changed. I often think about the first time that I ever experienced that healing power of Jesus. I was 16 years old. I was on my knees next to my bed. And in many ways, like Thomas, I too wanted to see. I'd been on a quest. I'd been searching. I'd been reading the gospels. And I lifted my palms up like this and I just started to say, thank you, Jesus, because I read about the cross and the resurrection and I was overcome. And the only words that could come out of my mouth were, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. My friends, my life has never been the same since. And every single day that I encounter the risen Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can feel the Spirit guiding me to continue to reorder, to continue to turn, to continue to live a life transformed 
empowered. Have you ever seen the documentary Free Solo? It's a wild documentary about Alex Honnold who scaled El Capitan. Have you ever been to El Capitan? It's incredible. When we lived in California, we used to go to Yosemite all the time. And it's this incredible, just flat edged, 3,000 foot mountain that many people will climb with harnesses. Well, Alex wanted to be the first person to climb it without any harnesses or ropes. And when you watch it, you, you watch this guy and you think, wow, like he's, he's kind of crazy. Like he's kind of wild. Like he's obsessed with this. He is completely obsessed. In fact, so obsessed that he has altered his entire life to live this kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle that he calls dirt bagging, uh, where he lives in his van. He lives a very simple life. He only owns just a few pieces of clothing. Um, everything uh, is, is centered around becoming a greater climber. It's an intentional choice, he says. Listen to what he said in this documentary. He said, I want to climb in the best places in the world. And that's my focus. So I'm willing to give up having stability, having a shower, having whatever in order to climb the way that I want. And he goes on to say, I am probably more intentional with the way that I live my life than virtually anybody. I have made clear choices about what I find value in, what risks I'm willing to take. I am doing exactly what I love to do. It's very easy for someone sitting on the couch at home to condemn it as crazy and stupid, but I can justify all my choices. Can you say the same about your life? His whole life. His whole life is ordered and oriented towards this one thing. His choices, his decisions, the way he spends his money is all about climbing the best places in the world and he takes risks, he puts his life on the line. I sometimes wonder what it would be like if Christians had that same kind of single-minded focus and obsession about Jesus. That if we responded, much like the disciples, as Jesus offers himself, that Jesus would become that obsession, that single-minded focus, that we would order and orient our entire lives around, that we every single day would be doing these 180s. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, when the, when the early church was asked, why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? Their answer was simple. Jesus, has a, Jesus is alive and Jesus has been raised from the dead. And that changed everything for them. That reoriented everything for them. And that transformed their entire being. And for the early church, Jesus was the center. Jesus was the obsession. Jesus was a single-minded focus. And they lived believing that Jesus is alive. Can we say the same? Let us pray. God, we confess that sometimes we make you into a, a factual confession. We confess that sometimes we make you into a check off the box, that we compartmentalize you, that we silo you. And yet here you are standing before us as the crucified risen Lord offering yourself over and over and over again. God, we want to believe, we want to see, we want to know, we want to experience. And when we do, let it not be in vain. And so God, we respond, my Lord, my God. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.